Amen. Thank you. Uh, as we were worshiping, Debbie felt like maybe God gave her a, a word of scripture to share with you, so I'm going to have her do that before I start. So, The song we were singing, No Weapon Formed Against Us Shall Prosper, the rest of that, it's Isaiah 54, 17, every tongue that rises against us in judgment, you will refute. And um, I'll read it. It's, but in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. And um, maybe some of you have had someone say something against you, or the enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. And sometimes there's chaos, there's voices that rise against us, even our own voices, maybe things from the past, the enemy wants to use that to come against us and raise that judgment. And these are our benefits. In the midst of the chaos, we can have that peace to say, I come against you in the name of the Lord. Every tongue I will refute. I will say it doesn't stand. It has no basis. And that's our peace that we have from God. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord. That's good, to have his peace, right? And today, you, some of you already used a bunch of my stuff, so we're almost done. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, what is peace? It's more than a, I, I like it on those uh, beauty pageants. What do, you know, what do they want to have? They all want world peace, and uh, it's become kind of a joke among those kind of things in that area. But uh, I think also we need to understand that peace is not something that's, an impossibility. How often does it look like it's impossible for peace to ever be uh, brought about? And, you know, or it's not an elusive uh, vision or dream that we hope for, but it's always escaping us. God wants us to have peace. And, uh, you know, the, the Hebrew word for peace, of course, is shalom. The one, if I get close to the, the one Hebrew word I can pronounce, shalom. And uh, I saw somebody, we had good friends in Florida, they had that on their door, shalom, y'all, uh, you know. And uh, so I thought, you know, but peace, that peace that comes from God that we may not understand. And this term means more than, and it, it's far more than just the absence of war. It's more than just the absence of stress or uh, conflict. Uh, shalom's a very, pretty big word in the Hebrew aspects of what peace is. Uh, I like in the fire Bible, it gives you a little small definition. It says, it basically is meaning is the positive presence of harmony, um, unity, cooperation, good relationships, wholeness, uh, good purpose, well-being, and contentment in all areas of life. Uh, shalom is it's a broad thing. It's, it's more than just the absence of. But it's more so the presence of. The presence of God brings all of that wholeness and that completeness that we, are, that we desire in our lives and we desire for things. And, you know, Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. So this peace is connected to our trust. It's connected to him. It's not so much something we can have. And you referenced, I think, John chapter 14, where Jesus says, and I like the King James in this one, it says, these things I have spoken, uh, John chapter 14, verse 25 through 27 says, these things I have spoken unto you, being, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, I give unto you. Let your hearts be, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus and the, the Word of God over and over assures us that he is wanting to grant us and give to us peace. 
that completeness, that wholeness. And today, uh, there's some different areas, and I'm going to ask some of you to help me at the close today. Uh, so, uh, Bill, if you would uh, be ready, and Mark, and I believe, John, you're going to help us. We're going to pray for the peace of God to come. And there's different areas uh, where, um, where we need to experience God's peace and uh, where his peace needs to be brought. One is in our world, and, and we see nations at this point, uh, you know, I wonder what it must have been like for people before World War I struck or World War II. But, you know, many are saying we're on the brink of another one of those kinds of conflicts in the worlds around us, and we see almost daily another report of an attack just recently, of course, with Israel and all that's going on with Israel and, you know, that's biblical and that's something we see. So, but the world is at a place of conflict. It's not a place where there's this harmony or there's, and, and much of that goes back to more than we may understand because in those parts of the world, those conflicts have been going on for a really long, long time. But Bill, at the close, if you would be kind of ready to pray for the world and especially Israel, I know that's a special spot in your heart and that kind of thing, but that's a place that we need to see the peace of God come. I'm not going to spend time this morning looking into the Word in reference to the, how, because the Word does have a lot of reference to what God will do with the nations. Uh, but that's not my, felt like where God wanted us to spend a lot of time today. And there's another one, is in our own nation. Uh, we look at our own nation, and it's, you know, you like the, people want to live in a, in a nation where there's, uh, where there's peace, where there's that wholeness of the social, the, you know, you look at what's happened socially and morally in our country, and it's very disturbing. I mean, I'll say for me, it's very disturbing to see where our nation is at socially and morally. Uh, you just look at the things that's going on in our world in our nation uh, in morality and you look at where we're at socially there's uh, this is this is a time where there's great conflict uh, I mean there's all kinds of issues that we could get into in our nation that uh, and even the economics you know you want to live a, a nation lives at peace when the economics are good right people aren't as stressed they're not as the whole nation as a whole but I just saw a, a t-shirt the other day at Little King. I almost bought it, but then I was like, no, I won't buy that. But it was a good one because on the front it said, the most expensive piece of equipment you will ever operate. And it had a picture of a shopping buggy for the grocery <laughs> store. You know, I was like, that's pretty getting true right now. You, to operate that buggy is costly when you go into the store. You know, you put a couple of things in that buggy, and next thing you know, it becomes expensive, right? Uh, but we want to pray for our nation. And... Uh, with all the anxiousness and all the stuff that's going on in our, and the division, the bitterness, uh, you just see it. Uh, people are, are, there's conflict. You, you know, we're headed into the, the political season where people are going to tell us all kinds of things, right? I mean, the media is going to lie to you and I, to us, over and over. Um, politicians are going to lie to us over and over. It's sad, but unfortunately, that's pretty re much a reality, uh, so we need God to bring a, a peace to our nation. And Mark, if you kind of be thinking and being asking the Holy Spirit, I'd like you to pray for our nation as we, as we come to that. But once again, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. I think there's a great need in our nation for peace to come. Uh, but, and the Bible will, you know, addresses those things of nations. The other one is uh, there's, there's a third place where we need peace. And uh, I could spend a lot of time on this one as well for for our searching the scriptures, but when it comes to families and churches, uh, man, is it, a, you know, we see families at odds, brokenness in the home, brokenness in the churches. Uh, this week I've had several things come across my, as a pastor, I, keep, I still keep up with some stuff, and I saw some things this week, I was like, that can't be happening. Uh, this is, you know, there's some things that are going on in the church world where there's not unity, where there's division, where there's the enemy is using different tactics and different things in the body of Christ to cause all of these things to happen. And, and, and you know, we need to stop and say, God, uh, you know, we need your help 
in the church today to experience and stand together. Um, and so there's that need. And we want to pray for that. And Jonathan will ask if you will, you know, we're going to agree in prayer today. I just felt like as I was preparing and thinking of coming, we need to, we need to close out our time today praying for some of these things and for these uh, things that are going on around us because God wants to bring peace to those things. And it's not impossible, but only God can do that. And I believe one of the things that we can do in reference to the world our nation, and the body of Christ as a whole, and I'm talking about the body of Christ as a whole, uh, we can pray, and we can do our part. But then the other part I want to spend a little more time today in the Word on is personal peace. How do you and I have peace when we see all the things I just talked about? I mean, I don't know, those things could get really weighty. Uh, you may, you know, you look at the world and you think, wow, this, is, this, this could be it. Or you look at the nation, and you go, wow, how are we going to ever overcome these things? Is it ever going to turn around? And then we look at family members or church things. Maybe you're going through, like Deb said, maybe there's some things going on either in your family or, you know, you've got things going on at work or you've got things going on even internally in your own heart where you're trying to say, God, I need, to, I need your help because in myself I cannot sustain or get through this. So the personal piece, how do you and I... How, first of all, how do we get peace? The things I wanted to just look at for us individually and as a group, how do we get peace? Where do we find this peace that we need? Where It talks about that wholeness to where we, we're complete. We don't have, and, and, and you know, you've, you've said it, our songs, some of the things you guys are saying, one is the enemy of our peace is that anxiety, fear, anxiousness, uh, disappointments that come in life, things that we can't control. Uh, you know, how many times when you don't have control, you get anxious? You know, if I can't control it, something's wrong. And reality is sometimes we have to give up that control over to God and say, God, I will let you be in control, not me. And so many times we, we, we get our peace taken away from us. So how do we get it and then how do we keep it? Those are the two things I want us to think about a little bit and ask the Holy Spirit just to touch our hearts on for us individually and uh, as we walk through this because uh, some of those other things may seem very overwhelming. They do to me. I mean, when I see that. But the reality is I need to be at peace. If I'm going to have a positive impact on any of those other areas, it's only going to be if I am walking in peace. It's only if you and I are walking in that presence of God where we're at peace can we have an impact that's going to be positive on the rest of the world around us. And Isaiah, so the problem is, okay, where do we find it? Well, one thing, you're not going to find it from the world. The wicked will not be at peace. Do you know that the word of God in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 18 through 21, it really gives us an insight that you're not going to find it in the world. The wicked will never have peace. Yep. It says in Isaiah 57, 18, it says, I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. I will lead them. I will comfort those who mourn. Now, here's the key to what he's saying. Those who mourn. Obviously, if you're mourning, you're repenting, right? You're coming to a recognition that you need to change and things need to change. He says, uh, I will comfort those who mourn. Bringing words of praise to their lips, may they have abundant peace. See what he says? May they have abundant peace, both near and far, says the Lord, who heals them. But this is what he says next. He says, but those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. The world will never have its peace as long as it keeps rejecting and rebelling against the Word of God. As, as, and, you know, and that would also translate over to us. If we're going to rebel against Him, and we're going to kick it, it's almost like I was just reminded, Paul, when he was on his way to, to Damascus, I believe it was, to persecute the church, Jesus says to him, when he comes and knocks him down on the ground and puts him to where he can't see anymore, he says, why are you kicking against me? You're not ever going to have peace, Paul, until you submit to my rule and my lordship over your life. And so 
The wicked is not going to... So we're not going to find peace in the world system. Uh, another scripture that it very clearly states that, Jeremiah 6.13, says, From the least to the greatest, their lives are ruled by greed. From prophets to priests, they are all frauds. They offer su superficial treatment for my people's mortal wounds. They give assurance of peace when there is no peace. This world will tell you if you have enough stuff, you'll have peace. You know, if you have enough money, you'll have peace. If you have this relationship. You know, one of the things as a pastor I always think is interesting is when people say, if I could just find the right person to get married to, I'll have peace. I'll have happiness. You know what I tell them? I say, if you ain't happy now, you're going to be worse when you get married. Right? If you're expecting somebody else to be your happiness and your peace, other than Jesus, you are putting your confidence in the wrong place. But how often does the world lie? The world lies to us about what will bring real peace. Because more money will not do it. Uh, you know, I've never been on that side of it, but I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm pretty confident more money isn't going to help. Because uh, I've seen some pretty wealthy people that if, that if that's what made them happy, it isn't working. I've also seen people that are very blessed with wealth and are very content and happy because it doesn't rule them. So I'm not saying that you can't have wealth and, and, and not have peace. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is if you're looking to the wealth to make you have peace, you're going to sorely find yourself disappointed. Another one is Isaiah 58 or 59.8 says this, They don't know where to find peace or what it means to be just and good. They have mapped out crooked roads and no one who follows them knows a moment of peace. And in Romans 14, Paul says in Romans 14, 17, he says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and, will, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see what Paul says? It's not about what you eat and you drink. It's not about what you have. It's about the Holy Spirit. That's what brings peace. And as it says there in, 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 um, in Isaiah, it's not about, you know, when you go the crooked path, you're going to not experience, you'll never experience peace and when you were going against what we know God's word says for us to do. And I think that's one of the reasons we see so much turmoil in the world today as people are, are constantly rejecting God's word. Even in the church today, we're, comprom we're seeing what I was saying about praying for the church. So many are compromising what the word of says. You know, I, I saw an article, I didn't read it because I, just a headline, just a part of, the first part of it made me go, ah, I'm not going to waste my time with that. Because it says, can we agree to disagree on sexuality as Christians? And I'm like, I don't see where we could choose to agree or disagree on what God says about sexuality. Amen. You know, it's, it's, it's right there. He created man and woman. He has designed marriage as the way for that to be expressed and, and, and to proper, I mean, to bless people is through marriage. Anything outside of that is not going to bring about what God's desire. But that's where we, we, we allowed the crooked paths to infiltrate, and that's not going to be a place of peace. No peace. It says here, so we're not going to find peace in that. So where can we find peace? Only one place, right? Where do you find your peace? In Jesus. We were all in rebellion against God, right? That's what Paul says. We all sin come short of the glory of God. In Romans, he says that. We see all throughout Scripture it, that we have been in conflict since Adam and Eve in the garden. There's been conflict between humanity and God. And God is the only one who could reconcile that relationship. Because peace comes from right relationship. Have you ever had people that you knew you weren't in right relationship? Did you have peace about seeing them? <laughs> Until you resolve it, you still look at it and go, they're coming that direction. I think I'm over here today. Right? You, you know that it, you just have this avoidance until you get it resolved. And so without Jesus, we don't have peace. Without what he did for us. In Romans chapter 5, it says, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God, because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. 
Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of under, undeserved privilege where, now, where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look to, forward to sharing God's glory. Because of what Jesus has done, you and I are now allowed to have peace with God, which also will now bring us to that complete place of knowing confidently that we are right with God. Not, so, not because of what we've done. You and I cannot earn our way into the kingdom, right? We can't earn our own way into peace. We can't produce peace. But we can receive that peace from Christ and his work on the cross. Paul also says it another way in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. He says, For God in all his faithfulness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Isn't that an amazing scripture that God gives us to say, you can have complete peace because of what Jesus has done and what God the Father has done and what the Lord has brought about for us. So the only way to find peace is first humbling ourselves and saying, Lord, I, and, and you know, come to that place of repentance, sometimes daily. Father, I have sinned. I've come short. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for that. It's like, like was said earlier, our past is no longer our issue, right? Because it's been forgiven. Peace comes through that right relationship that's been made possible. So how do we find it? We find it in Jesus. We find it in the forgiveness that's been made available to us <laughs> through the work of the cross of Calvary. So this morning... When people want to know how can you have peace, you can let them know it's because of who Jesus is. It, and and I, you know, I, I like what you said earlier. I think it's not like my outward circumstances may not be the best, right? Stuff around me may not be the best. There may be stress. There may be issues. There's things that we're walking through. There's things that we have to deal with on a regular basis. But that's not where my peace is. That's outward things. Inner peace comes from the inside. And that's because of Jesus living inside. And that's where we start with. That's where we, get, we find it. Now, the next really thing, though, is how do you keep it? How do you stay in that place where there's peace? You know, is it, you know, get peace and then just go live out in the woods all by yourself? You know, be a monk. You know, you can... Go out there and not have anybody around. You can say, man, if I can just get away from everybody, I'll have peace. Nobody can steal it then, you know. But sometimes we're our biggest thief of our own peace. <laughs> not somebody else. It's usually us losing it somehow. Uh, so how do we keep that peace? How do we maintain that place where we walk in his peace? And, and it comes to the scripture, you, I think you Philippians 4. Go to Philippians 4 again. Philippians 4. Paul says some things in this chapter. Well, all of, the, all of Philippians is an amazing book, okay? I mean, when you put it in context, just remember this. The Philippian church was born out of Paul and Silas getting beaten. Actually, it was before that. I mean, they show up in the Philippi, and there's no one there. There's not even a synagogue because they end up going down to the river for a place of prayer. They meet some ladies, and those ladies came and accept Christ, and then they start preaching the gospel, and this is in Acts, by the way, you can look at it, but just to have a background of what Paul was saying to these people, you have to understand what happens in their lives. And Paul cast out a demon out of this demon-possessed girl and gets beaten and thrown in prison. And in the middle of the night, him, he's got Silas there, and I always find that an amazing event in early church history. Paul and Silas are hanging there, in the inner prison so they can't ever get away and they're in pain because they have gotten beaten I mean they've got open wounds alright they're bleeding literally they are bleeding from being beaten 
And Paul looks over and says to Silas, I have to think, he says, hey, let's sing a psalm. And they start singing psalms and praising God in the middle of their pain and all. Is that a place? They had peace. Even though they were beaten, even though they were in prison, and they didn't know what the next day was going to be. They may get beaten again. All they know, they don't know. They're there just giving praise to God. That's the background of what this letter is about. And he says, rejoice. <laughs> Look at it. Verse 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Look, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. There's a whole bunch of sermons in this right here, okay? We could be here for a really long time just taking this and breaking it down. But in brief, look at it, just, and you can dig into these a little more on your own. But first he says, rejoice, have joy. You know, when we, if we lose our peace, you're not going to have joy. But if you have peace, you're going to have joy. They are hand in hand. They walk together. They're, they're right there together. But he says, rejoice in the Lord and what he has done for you. Joy comes from those inner things that God has done for us. And Paul is telling them, you're going to face trouble. He doesn't ignore the fact that he's in prison when he writes this, by the way. I mean, Paul's in prison when he writes this. In fact, one of the great parts of this is he says, hey, I don't know whether it's better to die or just, you know, just die or stay. I mean, that's his mindset. When he writes this in chapter 1, he says, hey, it's better for me to die and go on to be with the Lord, but it's also more beneficial for you as a church for me to stay, so I guess I'm staying for a little while, Right? So he has this mindset. He has joy in the midst of his imprisonment and potential death. But he says, you guys need it. So one of the ways that we keep our peace is to rejoice. Just give thanks in all things. The second thing he thinks he says is if that's, and by the way, if rejoicing is a challenge, the next one's even more challenging. <laughs> this progressively gets more challenging as he goes through this scripture here. If you really want to talk and look at it, it just progressively is like, really, Bob? You want me not just to rejoice, but then you want me not to be worried? Mm -hmm. You don't want me to be anxious? You don't want me wringing my hands and wondering, how is this going to work out? You know, and that's not saying, I'm sure in this room, all of us have had circumstances in life where we've looked at it and we've been anxious. It's part of our human nature that we have to overcome. There's not been anything probably that there's not a person in here that's been exempt from worrying about something at some time in our journey with God, right? But Paul says, don't let those things consume you. Stop. As soon as you start being anxious about something, as soon as you start worrying about it, and, you know, there's all kinds of things that can do that. Uncertainty can make us anxious when we're uncertain how this is going to be done, or trying to figure out how you are going to accomplish a challenge can be, makes us anxious sometimes. There's all kinds of things in those things, but in all of these things, it could be the economy, it could be pain, it could be the lack of control that we talked about earlier, circumstances. All of these things can start piling up, and fear and worry and insecurity starts taking hold. That's when we have to stop because that will rob us of our peace. That will take your peace and rip it away really quick. But if we stop and say, okay, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm going to pray. Because that's the next thing he says to them. He says, he says in all things. And by the way, if you want to dig in a little more, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, he talks about don't worry. 
Don't be anxious about anything. And he talks about what people worry about, you know, and he says, don't worry. And I just thought of a bad song. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> you guys all remember that song? Don't worry. I'm not going to sing it, Brian. It not, would be good. But then he says, pray for all things. That, and, 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 and he says, just pray about everything. Present, you know, I think God is just waiting for us to take time, stop, and say, hey, Lord, I need some wisdom on this. I need your guidance on this. I need your strength on this. I need your power on this. I need your comfort in this. There's all kinds of things that God is just waiting. And, he, and Paul even says, he says, hey, if you feel that stress coming, stop and take it to God. I like what Peter says. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety, all your cares on him, because he cares for you. And it goes on to say, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Listen, one of the things is from Peter, we're not, we're, we're not the only ones that's ever suffered. We're not the only ones that's ever had some of those things. In fact, uh, sometimes you, you get into situations and if you start going through stuff, you realize that, yeah, I've got it bad right now, but these guys have got it worse. You know, there's always someone that's seemingly got it a little harder than what we have. But Paul, Paul and Peter both are telling us, when you, when you have your peace, the way to maintain it, one of the first things is to do is learn to pray and intercede and bring those cares to him because he is able. Who else should we go to? I mean, you can come to me, and I might be able to help you a little bit or encourage you a little bit, but I don't know everything, right? You can go. I mean, we do pray for one another. We pray with each other. But God says, you come to me with your prayer. Why? Because he has the answer. You know, we don't just do it as an exercise of fertility or just to have therapy. Don't go to God in prayer thinking you're going to get therapy. You're going to get an answer. Mm -hmm. It may be an answer you don't want to hear. It may be an answer that you're excited to hear. But you'll get what you need. You go to him and say, I need wisdom. Expect him to give you wisdom. You go expecting comfort. He will give you comfort. Go expecting what you need. God has the answer for it. And he can intervene too, by the way. How many of us have had God intervene on circumstances that we thought impossible, but God, I'm going to come and ask you anyway. And he says, it's not impossible. You know, I, I worked construction in Pittsburgh one time. Me and this one guy, we worked together all the time. We were on, work, one, <clears throat> we were on an office building for like 16 months, and he and I were partners every all the time. And we came up with a little thing because the foreman realized that the two of us was kind of the guys that didn't care what job you gave us, just give us something to do. And we got the reputation kind of, if it's really hard, have Rick and Eddie do it because they, you know. And we came up with a little thing. We said, the hard to get stuff we do right away. The impossible takes us just a little longer. <laughs> and sometimes you got to have that mindset with God. It may take a little longer. But it's not impossible because he will come through for you. He will take care of you. So go to him in prayer. Keeping your peace means taking it to prayer. The other one here, he says, set your thought life in order, right? So, so many times we get going on. As, I don't know about you, but I argue with myself more than I do most anybody. Uh, other, other than Debbie. But no, we don't argue that often. But I argue with myself quite a bit. All right? Get that thought life in order. And there's a great thought process here that, and, and I don't want to take, the, you know, we don't have the time to take, but if you just look at it, he says, here's the, and, and I've, I heard a doctor, um, there was a guy in the, in the assemblies uh, a, a while back named Richard Dobbins. Mm -hmm. And Richard Dobbins uh, established one of the best um, counseling centers for the Assemblies of God in Akron, Ohio. It's still there. It's called Emerge Ministries, and it's still in operation, even though he's passed away. But he did a whole teaching on this section right here. 
and it was like a funnel. He says, this is like a funnel or a filter. And it has to get past each one of these in order for it to be an appropriate thought. Is it honorable? If it's not honorable, you kick it out right away. If it's not pure, you kick it out right away. If it's not, if, you know, you got the list there. You go through that list and eventually it comes down to where there's only a few things that are going to get through there. And you use that thought process to funnel those things out. It may be true. Okay, it can get through the truth part. But is it honorable? You see what I'm saying? There's certain things. Those things, you know, it may be true that you, you know, I'll use one of his illustrations. It may be true that you see me uh, at a restaurant with another lady other than Debbie. But that doesn't mean that it's, I'm out messing around with this other lady, right? It might be my sister. It may be somebody else that is, you know, that, and Debbie's in the bathroom because it's very rare that I'm ever anywhere with another lady other than her if she's not there. You know what I'm saying? So somebody might come out and see me sitting at the table. Debbie's gone to the restroom. I'm sitting there, you know, and but it, so you, you stop those thought processes of, of letting that funnel work. And so you might want to take the time to look at that, but keep your thoughts in line. And now the other one that may be a little bit different, Paul says here, and I, I think it's an interesting thing that Paul says. He says, keep practicing what you know is right. Practicing what you have seen me do. Right? What have they seen Paul do? They saw him in prison, beaten, and worshiping God. They saw him take authority over the demonic and cast it out. They had watched him preach faithfully the word of God. They had watched him handle different circumstances. Even here you see in the first part of the chapter 4, he says, hey, help these two sisters get along so that there be unity in the body. Right? They have watched Paul live, and one of the most challenging ones in chapter 4, we're not even going to go there, but if you go down to verse 12, I think it's verse 12. Everybody likes verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That one everybody almost knows. Nobody thinks about the one right in front of it. Because right in front of it says, I have learned the secret to be content in whatever situation I'm in. Then I can do all things through Christ. Right? We, 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 I don't know. I like, you like to jump down to that one. I can do all things through Christ. But do I want to be content in every situation? Because if you read his situation, some of them were not good. I mean, there was times where he had no food to eat. There was times where he didn't have the right clothing. He didn't have the right shelter. There was times he was in the ocean for a day and a half. But Paul said, I've learned a secret in all of those places to be content. You want to keep your peace? Learn to be content. But more importantly, or maybe as important, he says, set your heart on doing what is right. Did you know when we're right and we're doing what's right, we are in the place where God's presence will be evident? Because that's what he says here. God loves being with his people. And he loves when he sees us doing right. And I think Isaiah 32 talks about this. Isaiah 32, 16 says, Justice will rule in the wilderness and righteousness in the fertile field. And this righteousness, listen to what he says, and this righteousness will bring peace. Yes, it will bring quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in safety, quietly at home. They will be at rest. When you and I live according to God's word, and we live a righteousness that, and, and listen, we all know it's not our own righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But his righteousness, is what it's talking about. And if we live in his righteousness, which means now he lives in us, therefore we're going to live right. We're going to experience his peace. How do we maintain our peace? A lot of it is in how we live. Whether you know, And we're living in a culture where sometimes grace has been abused. And, and I thank God for his grace. But there's also that element of responsibility and living a way that honors God. And that's when we live in peace. So how do we keep all those things? And the last one I want to mention, and I know I'm, I'm throwing there a bunch of stuff out there today, so you can, you can say, too much. Or you can say, I'll take that and leave this. 
Okay? That's why I throw a bunch out there. Because this way, if you get one, that's all right. You, know, you don't have to get them all. But this one here is probably the most important one. The, probably the most important thing to keep us in a place of peace once we've attained it through repentance and accepting the work of Christ is also second, is, is receiving the part that he says in John chapter 14. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I think it's interesting that right after he says that, that's when he says, peace I leave with you. The way you and I can ensure to keep and maintain and, and, and hold on to our peace is through the person of the Holy Spirit actively being filled in our lives to guide us, to walk through those things, and correct us when we're about to go the wrong way, to encourage us when we need encouragement, to empower us when we need empowerment, to be that source of counsel when we need counseling, to teach us the Word of God so that we will live the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is so essential. I think Galatians 5.22, Paul says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So, in, in verse 25 he says, Since we are living by the Spirit... Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So, how do you and I, I think one of the crucial elements of maintaining our peace with God is having a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Allow Him that full access into our lives to where He empowers us to live in peace. Because God wants us all to have peace. He wants the world to know peace. He wants our nation to to come to a place of peace. He wants our families and our churches to walk in harmony and unity and, and, and completeness. But a lot of that starts with you and I allowing it first to be right here in our own inner heart. If we want the church to be in peace, we need to have peace. If we want our families to experience it, we need to experience it. And, and, you know, and, and so many times, you and I cannot control what other people do. But we can yield our own heart and our own lives to God. And we can then receive that peace ourselves for what God wants to have in our lives. Because there's things that happen in, in families and in, in the world and in the church and all of these places that really all we have sometimes is to pray. Maybe give insight, maybe give correction, especially as you work in leadership. There's times as pastors we have to, you know, so many times you, you correct things. Or you address things. But ultimately, we can receive that peace in our own hearts, in our own lives. And so, as, as we look at that, uh, you know, I think one last scripture that then we're going to have that prayer time uh, I, I spoke about. But one last scripture I think is always interesting is Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, verse 36 and 39 context of course Jesus has been crucified he's been buried for three days and the disciples have been hiding away thinking they may be next and they're fearful they're anxious they're all the things Jesus told them in Matthew 6 not to do don't be afraid things he told them in Matthew, or John chapter 14 right before he dies don't be anxious don't be afraid and they are they're hiding and what happens this is what I, I always think this is so cool it says while they were still talking about this, they were talking about Jesus has just walked the road to Emmaus with two disciples. They didn't know it until they asked him in and he sits and breaks bread and says the prayer. That's when they realized, That's, this is Jesus, and then he was gone. So they run back to Jerusalem, and they're now in the room with the other disciples telling them, what happened? We saw Jesus. He's alive. You know, he was there. And the disciples, of course, are like, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. Okay. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And if you read it, also, they get freaked out. I don't know about you, but if you just saw somebody die, vicious, terrible, <coughs> murderous death, 
and they show up in the room with you three days later, it might, I don't know about you, but I think I'd get a little bit freaked out too. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but Jesus says to them, they were, look, I mean, it says, verse 37, they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is my eye myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. This is a firm confirmation of a physical resurrection, right? Not an apparition, not a ghost, not some other metaphysical anything. This is a physical person of Jesus who has been raised from the dead and is complete and whole. And they get scared. They get afraid. And he says, peace, peace. So when you and I experience some of the things that may be going in life that brings fear or anxiety or any of those things, just stop and listen because he's there. And he'll say, peace, be still, peace, I'm with you. I am here. And wherever he is, there will be peace because he is the prince of peace. So as we walk out this journey, let's ask God, help me to experience, first and foremost, that inner peace that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit that is made possible because of the blood of Jesus and the promises of his word. So I'd like us to take some time just to close out today. Just, you know, and you can go back and review that. Rejoice, be thankful, trust in the Lord, prayer, practices righteous living, and the Holy Spirit empowerment. Those all go hand in hand. They all go together. They work together. You pray the most powerful prayers when the Holy Spirit is praying through you. You, you, you practice the most righteous life when the Holy Spirit is leading and directing and guiding us. All of these things work together. But today I'd like us to pray, and we'll just take a moment. You, you know, they don't have to be long prayers. They don't have to be whatever, but just want us to just pray. And then I'm going to wrap it up and close out and pray for us all. But, uh, Bill, if you wouldn't mind going first and just lead us in prayer for the nation of Israel and the world, because the world is at, in turmoil. And that turmoil will have its impact on our lives as well. I mean, whether we, you know, we don't live on this world as an island to ourselves. And what happens in the world does impact us here. And so we want to pray for our world, and it is at a place, of, a very precarious place that we're, we're living in. History is really being written as we, as we live it out. And, you know, uh, what Jesus, what one of these scriptures said, the Lord said he's coming. And that could be any time, right? So go ahead, Bill, lead us in prayer. Let's agree in prayer, too. It's not just Bill praying. We are agreeing with him. Amen? I just want to read a couple of scriptures really quick. Isaiah 52. And I see that you spend a lot of time in Isaiah, and I would have as well. <laughs> How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, the, and publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. In Isaiah 63, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he established, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth that is coming that is coming hallelujah his first coming he shall step on the mount of olives and on his second coming it will be in the new jerusalem when he returns hallelujah father we just thank you lord and father i pray with my brothers and sisters for the nations lord forgive them forgive our president our vice president our congress our judicial system lord forgive the rulers of all the nations for they are bringing destruction on their own nation and upon their own people. Lord, they have passed laws that go directly against your commandments and against your word. Mm. They have called evil good and good evil. 
They have destroyed the lives of the unborn, your inheritance upon the face of the earth. And Father, we ask you to forgive them because they truly do not know what they're doing. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 And, and Mark, if you would, just uh, pray for our nation. Uh, it's, it's in a place where we need a move of God and another great awakening. History tells us there's been great awakenings in our nation. And we're at that crucial element and point of needing another awakening to the, to the things of God. Heavenly Father, I lift up this nation, the United States of America, to you. Lord, we're really on the precipice, it feels. We're on the edge of the abyss. Lord, I pray on behalf of the land and the people, the remnant, uh, the rank and file average American who uh, so many of us love you, so many of us are believers. And, and I pray for the wonderful document on which this land was founded, this country was founded, the Constitution of the United States, which is obviously disregarded by our elected representatives and disregarded even by the Supreme Court, which is supposed to backstop that document. And I pray for the principles on which this nation was founded, freedom and a reverence for you. And Lord, we are ruled by people who are evil. We are ruled by people who do not represent most of America. We're ruled by people that there is such corruption in the highest places. There are networks of pedophiles. There are human traffickers. The corruption is unbelievable, the financial corruption. It seems like our entire government has been weaponized against its own people and against the principles for which this nation was founded. In Washington, D.C., they scoff at you as a, as a quaint, mythical idea. In Washington, D.C., they enact laws constantly which are against your principles and against even the principles of the Constitution, and nothing happens. And on it goes. And so much has been revealed over the last, oh, I would say five years, that it's so clear that our leadership is terribly, terribly corrupt. And so in thinking about that, I thank you for this prayer that you've given me, which is based on what you said to Samuel. You said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And you said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And you said, In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And in one day, indeed, you judged Eli's house. You judged the entire house in one day. And I pray, Lord, that you would judge the evil leadership that has taken control of this nation, such that even our elections don't seem to matter. They've gamed everything. I pray you would bring such a judgment on, let me just call it Washington, D.C., as a single word. Even though I know there's good people in Washington, D.C., it seems like the city is almost wholly corrupt. And I pray you would bring such a judgment that the both ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle and that they will know that there's a God in heaven. And I pray that even though it seems impossible, I know that nothing is, imp is impossible with you, and I ask that you would yet preserve the Constitution, the people, and the land of this nation. Yes, God. And that somehow righteousness would rise again. Yes, that God. somehow a reverence for you yes, would God. rise again. Yes, and God. somehow that people yes, would see and know because yes. you move so mightily that this nation 
was founded by you and that this nation is one nation under God. In yes. Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we pray for our nation too, and for us, and John, I'm going to ask you to pray for the church. Something that if you've not been made aware of it, you know, one of the things I, I get concerned for the church is, will we have leadership that will actually stand up and address some of these issues mm -hmm. that they're saying are political, but they're not. They're moral. Uh, so we need to pray that God will raise up pastors in this, in this nation that will address these issues with truth and love. Uh, because that's a concern. One of the things that's being, uh, if any, have any of you heard of Christian nationalism? Mm -hmm. That's just another way. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very serious thing. They're trying to put Christians in a light to where we're nationalism. And, and reality is it's Christian patriotism. We're patriots of what you were praying about our Constitution and the foundations of this nation. And me, prior to just recent, you can go back and even find people like and I'm not a proponent of FDR. I think he didn't do some good things for us. But nevertheless, even he used in his speeches things about Christianity and about the morals and about the need for Christianity. Uh, there's quotes that... Uh, and I'll give you a resource if you want to look it up. There's a, there's a guy that does this. It's a resource called American, AmericanMinute.com. AmericanMinute.com. And he's a Christian man who... Is a historian. I mean, his history stuff, I love his historical, I just was reading some of his stuff on Christian nationalism versus patriotism. And they're trying to, they, they want to shut the voice of the Christians off. And they do that by using terms like, instead of pro-life, anti-abortion. Same thing with this new term or this term of current term, Christian nationalist, is to try to tell the church, you don't have a right to speak. You're just being this, this, bad thing so it, it's a political it's a it's semantics it's a way to to sh silence the voice of godly people and so as we pray for our nation and for our leaders in the church world we need to ask god to start raising up some people who will actually articulate speak to those things in a way that will bring repentance and will bring truth to bear on those topics and those subjects that need to be addressed from a biblical perspective and also that we would no longer compromise those things because i'm seeing that compromise in so many places that i'm getting sometimes i get surprised i'm like they actually did that <laughs> uh you know people who i am familiar with some of them and i'm like wow how did they get there and, and it's the enemy working and deceiving and just pounding away at this uh, you know, so I'll stop there because I could go too far. Dear Let's Heavenly pray. Father, Lord, we want to pray today, Lord, over over families, Lord. Have peace in families. Yes, God. And Lord, pray for your peace in your hand over all families in this world, Lord. We look around us and you know, we, we see what Satan has done over the years in the past throughout history He's attacked the family values. He's attacked families. And he knew you know, by doing that, it's going to destroy and decay this, this world. And, and, and we see it in the United States right now. And, Lord, we just pray that you have your hand over all families. You know, put that bubble over all families and, and, and create an atmosphere, Lord, where blessings are there for those and create a, an atmosphere where where god you want the families to to survive and to really make a difference you know i want to pray for the just the families in this area lord we see it all around us the homelessness that is just rampant it's it's it is just getting worse and worse and here in just greenville tennessee lord we want to pray for those people. Yes, we want to pay, pray for all families yes, in this community as well yes, and Jesus. do things to grow those families to where they'll, yes, they'll prosper instead of decay. Yes, Lord. Lord, and, and I want to pray for this church. Yes, God. Psalm 133 talks about the Lord being so pleased 
with unity mm -hmm. in the church family. Yes. And I want to pray for that. I want to pray for this church's family. I want, I want to pray for each and every one in here today that, that, Lord, put your hand around every family here and we will prosper and we will not decay and we will turn Green County upside down yes, through our family values. Yes, Lord. So we pray for that today, Lord. Thank you for what you do for us every single day. Thank you for, for just making our families prosper and continue to grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I just feel, as you were praying, John, that God does want to bless the family unit again. And one of the biggest problems, one of the huge problems in our nation reverts back to the family unit being destroyed. Uh, lack of fathers divorce, breaking homes apart. Um, those are all things that have eroded a lot of the values that we have. Uh, and much of that goes back either to the church or it goes back to our educational system and all of that that's broken. Now, the last thing that you want to do is come to church and go away depressed. Okay? So there is hope. There is, a, there is hope in Christ. Yes. And uh, we do pray that God will infuse us with his hope and with his encouragement and with his, with his assurance that, yes, everything looks really, in some ways it looks really bleak, but in other ways it looks very exciting because I believe we're on the very place where God can bring a great awakening and a great revival across this nation. Because ultimately the main thing is not that everybody has this, huge economic boost or the real thing that God wants to do is bring people to repentance where they will spend eternity with him. And sometimes heartaches and hard things brings people to repentance more than prosperity does. I mean, that's just, unfor I mean, that's the reality. A lot of times when you don't have a need, you don't have a repentance. But when people are going to face some of the things that may be coming down the road because of, uh, you know, uh, those things, and I've struggled with some of this in the respect of, God, if you judge, if you don't judge America for its sin, where is the justice? But on the other hand, I see that when, when Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, well, if there's 50, well, if there's 40, well, if there's 30, well, maybe 20. How about we go for 10? And unfortunately for Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't even 10. I believe the only thing that stayed the hand of God is what you prayed, Mark, is there are still a good number of believers that are true believers, that are true followers of Christ, that are still praying for this nation and standing in the gap. And that's why we haven't had some of the judgment that we would deserve rightly. But there's also that element that I believe God will say enough is enough. And now it is time. And when that comes, I believe we'll see a revival. I believe that may usher in a true repentance that says this is right and that over there is way wrong and people will return and and if not then God will take care of that too so for us I pray that we will walk in peace confidence assurance that inner part of us that says it is well with my soul and you know that song it is well with my soul is a powerful song when you know the context that it was written in. And if you don't know the context that it was written in, it was written by a man who had lost his family at sea, and he's that they've taken him and the others that were survivors of, to that spot, and he was there where he had lost his wife and his daughters, and he said, it is well with my soul. And, you know, that's where we need to get in that sense of, God, it is well with my soul. As I journey through this life, it is well. Mary, it is still well with your soul. You've lost, you know, I've been praying, we pray for you. And even in that grief, there is, it is well with our soul. It may, doesn't mean there's not grief, doesn't mean there's not loss, doesn't mean there's not turmoil at times. But it's still deep down inside, out of this inner confidence, knowing that no matter how bad it gets, it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. 
Somewhere God is going to intervene. It may be here or it may be there in his presence, but it's going to get better. So, Father, I just pray for each one of us in this place that we would rejoice in you, that we would give thanks because you have been more than gracious, more than kind. You have been so wonderful to every one of us and that you have forgiven us of our sin, that you have made it possible for us even to enter into your presence through the blood of your son, Jesus. So we rejoice and we give thanks for you doing that work that we could not do. God, that we will put our trust in you and we will obey your word and we will continue to intercede and pray for our world, for our nation, for our families, for our churches. We will pray for one another and we will present ourselves to you and say, Lord, here am I. I need your help. I need your wisdom. I need your insight. I need your comfort. I need you to work and do what only you can do to bring that place of peace in my life so that we will live in a way that honors you. God, let us not ever dishonor your name. Yes. Let us never misrepresent you and how we live. But give us lives that are set apart to be different, to be holy, and to do the right things in this world. And God, we recognize the only way that's going to be really possible is if you fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with the empowerment that comes from your indwelling Spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth, that empowers us to live and to honor you. So Lord, fill everyone with your Holy Spirit in such a way that we will walk out our lives in your presence with you in that place of peace that comes, wholeness, harmony, contentment, that we will go without strife and we'll go without anxiety, that every fear, every worry, every concern that tries to grip our hearts will come under the authority of your word and under the authority of your name and will be dispersed and done away with. And in that place will be a flood of confidence, assurance, knowing that you are present and that all things, your word says all things will work together for our good as we love you and obey you. So bless your people with your peace and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.